Nexa Literature Festival in association with Nexa at Charbagh. We're delighted to introduce session number 66, Client Earth, with Jairam Ramesh, Martin Goodman, and David Wallace Wells in conversation with Jeffrey Gettleman, presented by the Motwani Jadeja Foundation. Jairam Ramesh is a member of parliament and chairman of the Standing Committee on Science and Technology, Environment, Forests and Climate Change. Martin Goodman, Martin Goodman's client Earth about eco-lawyers saving the planet, written with James Thornton, was the business book of the year. David Wallace Wells, deputy editor at New York Magazine and the author of the international bestseller, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming. Jeffrey Gettleman is the New York Times South Asia Bureau Chief and winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Join me in welcoming them. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming to, to hear us. Um, I don't think there's a more important issue that's being talked about at this festival than, than the climate and the future of the Earth. And yeah, let's hear it for Earth. Earth. It's a nice place, right? Um, and so on this panel, we have some very different perspectives on how to tackle the problems we're all facing. Um, two of our panelists have written books from different outlooks about what the future holds. And our other panelist was the former Environment Minister of India and is still a member of Parliament on the um, Environment Committee in Parliament right now. So he's actually doing the work in a very important country at a critical time. So I'd like to begin uh, with Martin, who has a book uh, right here that I have called Client Earth. And the idea is that Earth is a client that has legal rights and should be represented to the best of our capabilities. And Martin, why don't you uh, take it away from there? Thank yeah. you. I'd like to tell you something about the story of the book and the process of writing the book as well. And the client Earth is also the name of a not-for-profit environmental law group that's based in London, started 13 years ago, and now has 160 lawyers across the, across the world. About 70% of those lawyers are women. Uh, when you go into the office, it's very much a, a sort of a, a woman's place when you go into it. Yeah. And um, it also uses many different laws. There aren't enough environmental laws, so it, it, use, it lose, uses corporate law and pensions law. It has a corporate division as well. And um, those laws are obviously necessary. Lawyers without laws don't really get very far. So I'd like to tell you something a bit about how that worked at the beginning and how this not-for-profit environmental, uh, environmental law movement started. So go back into the 1960s in America. There was Rachel Carson's book, The Silent Spring. That was one book being a literature festival that really did have an effect. There was this rising consciousness and surprisingly, um, this big raft of environmental laws came into being in the 1970s, in 1971, 1972, under Richard Nixon, under a Republican administration. But showing you the far-sightedness of lawyers, lawyers looking ahead, that's one of the themes of, of today, hopefully, a group of people got together to form the first not-for-profit environmental law groups because they thought, it's okay, the government's on side now. What happens if it changes? What happens if the government what doesn't want to enforce these laws? Who's going to regulate the regulator? So let's speed forward now to 1984, Ronald Reagan has come in. He doesn't want to enforce these laws. Uh, the en Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, needs a new director. He appoints one um, on the grounds that she is prepared to bring the EPA to its knees. The Clean Water Act, one of those new acts that came in, did have lots of data collection, lots of, regulation, lots of regulatory mechanisms in place. But the government went around and said, don't worry, collect your data, but we won't enforce it. So James Thornton, my husband, the co-writer of this, the founder of Client Earth, started single-handedly for NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, a citizen's enforcement project. It was him and one chemist taking on all of the cases that the EPA wouldn't do, the clean water cases. He had 60 cases going at once in federal courts and won every one of them. Went on to win 100 and eventually shamed the EPA back into enforcing those laws. Those were days when the US president, even a Republican, was someone you could shame. That's maybe changed a little bit now. <laughs> and, uh, 
I'm going to spin you forward again now. And from America, James went on to found the LA office of NRDC and then came for various reasons to London. And looking at this far-sightedness again, he wanted to move into, the, into London itself because you needed to be near the systems of power in order to affect power. But that, that meant Client Earth was founded by a little desk in our back bedroom. He'd go off into town, come back at night, taking out his inhaler because it gave him bad asthma, walking through the air pollution. I said, can't you do something about cleaning up the air? Big question. What could, it, what could a man do? But this far-thinking thing, first of all, he was appalled that you couldn't get into the courts to take environment ac environmental actions in the, most of the courts of Europe because the costs were too prohibitive. If you lost, you were threatened with having to pay the legal funds of the people that you were suing. So that could be a bill for millions of pounds. People tried it, and it cost them a lot of money. It wasn't happening. So James took various actions, enforcing a treaty, going to the, UN, going to the um, UN, going to the Environmental Courts of Justice, to bring in those limitations on costs within the UK courts. That, uh, then, again, if you got a law, you had to enforce it. So he went to look for a law that he could win. There was this Environmental Air Directive on the EU level, uh, that, that did, like the Clean Water Act, it collected data. So he took the courts, took the UK government to court for not enforcing its laws. I'm going to speed through this a little bit to various courts. We've been through the High Court, we've been to the um, European Court of Justice. We're now in the Supreme Court. The government's lawyers are there. They stand up, they say, okay, bang to rights, we admit it. We have broken the laws, broken the, the, the air quality laws. 40,000 people a year in Britain are dying because those laws are broken. And we will not comply for at least another 15 years. And look at this, wagging the finger at the Supreme Court judges. And you, the Supreme Court, may not order us to do so. So one very benign judge turned to uh, no, the client Earth and their representative says, you've heard what the government had to say. What do, what, what do you think that we, the Supreme con Court, can do? Because we are only the Supreme Court. And uh, so the response was, if this wasn't an environmental case, but say it was a family law case or a company case, and the government said, you cannot make us comply with the law, and they got away with that, we're no longer living in a democracy under the rule of law. We're living under fiat and diktat. So um, the, the, the Supreme Court gave that injunction. It's not so easy. You have to keep then taking. You never win a battle, a, a legal battle for the environment. You have to keep winning it. You have to keep going back again and again and again. But they did go back. And uh, what also happens is that when you've won court in one jurisdiction, it can then roll out into the others. So, for example, now th these clean, um, clean Air Acts are being enforced throughout Europe. In the home of the car industry, the diesel industry, Stuttgart and Munich and Dusseldorf, they banned diesel cars in the city center. Diesel car sales have come down 20% and they're speeding up electrification. I'm now going to move you forward just a little bit further, further out into Poland. James, looking ahead when he was setting things up, said, um, the science is the grammar of the law. We have to follow what the scientists say. It's what Greta Gunberg good, good, uh, is saying now. Follow the science. And um, so the science says that the worst thing for climate change is coal-fired power plants. In Poland, 34 coal-fired power plants were on the statute, were on the books, ready to be built. Um, they also had the biggest primeval forest, in, you know, the only primeval forest left standing in Europe, the Bielbecia Forest. They had pristine waterways, great, ag great agricultural systems. So James set up an office in, in um, Warsaw. And I went visiting. Um, as a, as a, I'm a writer, not a lawyer. So I understand things through story. Where do I get stories from? I get stories from people. What gave me tremendous hope throughout this whole project was meeting these people who had hope themselves, who uh, found out that the law is a tool, and they can go and address questions that most of us would find out to be impossible. And the f when I met the lawyers in Poland for the first time, I heard people using the terms civil society. I'd met lots of lawyers in, in America and Britain before that, that term civil society never came up. But in Poland, they were coming out of 
the communist regimes, where people didn't really feel they had a say. They had to be trained up in democracy, saying that what you say can affect other people. It can change things. I went up to uh, uh, Poznań, this little town up in the north of Poland, stood in a field with a farmer's wife, looking out at the fields that would go if this power station was built. Um, she looked at the wind turbine there, which, well, which was her friend. She loved the wind turbine. I sat around with true stakeholders. These were farmers, they were mothers, they were, they were children, they were teachers who wanted to stop this coal-fired power plant. And they told me that they would go to these meetings with the, with the lawyers, with the, with the coal-fired uh, power plant um, um, officials, and they'd be made to say, feel stupid because their questions weren't having any effect. They were the wrong questions. So first of all, lawyers taught them to, write, to ask the right questions. There was this courtroom then in Gdansk, right on the coast in the north of, in the north of Poland. These um, three lawyers came into this sweaty room and looked up in surprise. They're not used to seeing anybody out in the court. But in this courtroom, they had 70 farmers and their families waiting to see what could happen. Can the courts really um, give us some of our rights back? And the courts did. They, they actually put a complete hold on the coal-fired power plant, stopped it being built until the rights of these stakeholders were addressed. The good news there is that all 34 of those coal-fired power plants have been stopped. And... Uh, <laughs> hmm? Finish off? Okay. I've got to finish off. And uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about... Can I two more things, quickly? Okay. Two more things. One was activists in, um, in Africa that I went with. These were being trained up in how to use the laws. The laws were codified. They knew how to use it. They were training each other up. And they said that when we used to go to, to have a meetings with government officials, whenever they brought up the law to us, um, it ended the conversation. Now we've been trained up. We're not lawyers, but we've been trained up in the law. When they bring up the law, it triggers the conversation. Conversation begins. And I've got wonderful tales to tell about China. That was really the hopeful story of the book. And uh, the quick thing, that I thought it was going to be the bad news story. And, uh, but in fact, what I learned there about this whole principle of ecological civilization. So we've had Stone Age, we've had agriculture, we've had industrial, what's next? Ecological civilization. And, and China works out that it's been around for 2,500 years. It's building forward an extra 2,500 years, making sure that life here is sustainable, is sustainable for everybody. That in bringing people out of poverty, all their populations out of poverty, they haven't taken enough issues with that. Sorry, I've got to take a bit more water. I'm dry. And uh, so basically, well, they've got a lot of questions here about you know, the rule of law, how that's being applied in China. I think that will come up in conversation in a minute. They have decided to rewrite environmental laws. James was brought in to help on that. James uh, trained up the kind of trained up the Supreme Court judges, the 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 the, um, the three thousand environmental court judges. He said in 2018, "How's it going?" Because they suddenly found the rights as well to sue their own government. How's it going? They said, "Oh, not so very well, not very well." He said, "How do you mean?" Oh, we've only brought 48,000 cases. 48,000 environmental cases brought in China in 2018. Nearly all, over 90% of those won. So that for me is part of what I was writing here. It's an evidence-based narrative of hope. So from being in a position of despair now, beginning to understand what these laws are and how they can be applied, I feel that we can actually bring a level of hope to building this future together. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're allowed to take a long drink now from a plastic bottle. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about India. Um, one thing that struck, struck me as the New York Times guy covering South Asia is the severity of environmental issues in this part of the world. You have a perfect storm of a fast-growing population, a rapidly industrialized in area, and uh, a weak rule of law. Um, and it's, it's really troubling. I live in Delhi uh, with my family. You know, ha half the days of the year we're checking the AQI and wearing masks on our faces. Um, it's, it's the single worst part of, of what's happening, uh, I think, in India. So tell us, like, is the government waking up to this? Well, you know, I don't think, uh, I don't want to sound a reverse colonialist here, but I don't think India needs to be reminded of its environmental legacy because 
the entire basis of Indian civilization has been man living in harmony with nature. And the basis of Western civilization is man's conquest of nature. So, I mean, there is, over the long course of Indian history, a recognition uh, that what we take out of client earth, we must put back into client earth. And this, is, this has been said many years ago and it's been repeated endlessly. So, in terms of cultural traditions, in terms of civilizational characteristics, I think India is one of the few civilizations which actually venerates nature uh, in more respects than one. Gods, goddesses, rivers, animals, biodiversity, uh, and so on. However, that reverence for nature uh, has come bang and clashed with demographic pressures. It's come bang and clashed with uh, developmental imperatives. And over the years, uh, we have seen compromises being made uh, in favor of development, uh, which very often works to the detriment of the environment. So I think uh, it's good that the Western world is recognizing client earth. Uh, I think uh, the Western, there is, uh, if there is one model of unsustainable economic growth, it's the Western model, which unfortunately both China and India have copied. Uh, these are, you know, resource intensive, energy guzzling, uh, horizontal urbanization. Uh, this is the this is the economics model. Uh, there's only one model that economics has taught us for rapid economic growth, and uh, unfortunately, uh, countries like China and India have followed in that trajectory. Now, India has a historic opportunity of making a departure. That you know, you don't have to follow the traditional. Uh, grow now, pay later model, which is what economics, all economics models are. So choices have to be made uh, now so that we don't have to repeat the mistakes which the Western world has made and which the Chinese have made. Now, there is a recognition of this in India over the last, I would say, when I was environment minister, when I spoke of climate change, people thought I was crazy. You know, why, why am I talking of climate change? when the big priority in India is jobs, investment, urbanization, industrialization, and so on. But today, I think more people are concerned about climate change uh, because the frequency of floods has increased, uh, because of the uncertainty of the Indian monsoon, uh, because people are recognizing that the Himalayan glaciers are under retreat, and also people living in 7,500 kilometer long coastline are increasingly feeling vulnerable to the increase in mean sea levels. So today, uh, I don't think you need to an educate an Indian on uh, environmental issues, uh, that you need to have sustainable growth, that you need to worry about climate change. I think you have to educate the governments, really, that choices have to be made. And these are politically very difficult choices to make, you know? Um, to, tell pe to tell a government, don't build a six-lane highway now, uh, or don't uh, open up a coal mine now, uh, because, you know, this is going to add to uh, the environmental stress uh, and the benefits will come to you 15 years later or 20 years later. Governments generally are elected for a five-year term and they would like to see themselves measured in terms of jobs they have created, in terms of projects that they have cleared, you know, the visible symbols of development. Can I just ask so we have, we have problems. I mean, it's not as if... Uh, there is a recognition, there is a deep recognition of the problem, but... It's a, these are difficult choices to be made, and very often these choices, and remember in India we are making these choices in a democratic framework. These are, these are not top-down choices, uh, like for example, China can decide one day that three cities are going to be uh, closed uh, and 20 million people are going to be cloistered. It's simply not possible in the Indian context. So you have in India good examples of environmental stewardship, you also have very glaring inadequacies like air pollution in Delhi is a clear example of, of a system that has collapsed. But in terms of laws, India has the most progressive laws on environmental protection. Unfortunately, the enforcement of these laws has been very weak. If we have all institutions that were set up uh, in the 1970s. Uh, the institutions have atrophied over the years. Uh, and they need, um, they need to be really refurbished. Let me just close by saying one thing. In, you know, today it's fashionable to talk about 
planet Earth and climate change and so on. But when the first UN conference took place, the first UN conference on the human environment took place in Stockholm in, July, in June of 1972. The very first time that the UN recognized, the world recognized human environment as an issue was in 1972. And there was only one prime minister who went and addressed that conference, and it was the Indian prime minister. You know, no other, no American president, no British prime minister, no European prime minister, except Olaf Palme, who was the host prime minister in Sweden. The only prime minister who went and made an epochal speech there was the Indian prime minister. So what I want to say is, you know, it's not lack of awareness in India. Uh, it's not lack of sensitivity, but it's these demographic pressures as well as developmental challenges which very often lead us to make choices which put stress on the environment. Do you, let me just ask one follow-up. Do you think that this current government is working hard on improving the air quality or <laughs> the environmental picture in India? Well, I think this, this government has really woken up because, you know, Delhi, uh, Delhi has been affected. Now, there are parts of India which are worse than Delhi, which do not get the attention they deserve, but because Delhi has attracted uh, so much adverse attention, including critical articles in the New York Times, and no Prime Minister of India likes to see critical articles in the New York Times, let me assure you. So, we might have uh, a few more Delhi, coming. <laughs> so Delhi, <laughs> Delhi, has, <laughs> Delhi has occupied, uh, come to occupy central space. I think uh, this government has certainly uh, it's, you know, parliamentary democracies depend on a very simple principle. Where you stand depend on where you sit. Uh, and the present government was sitting in the opposition uh, 10 years ago, and they were then saying, oh, this environment is a luxury, it's a middle-class elitist pastime, we want growth, we want jobs. But now that they are in power, uh, they have changed their tune. Uh, and the prime minister has now emerged as the uh, big champion of solar energy, uh, you know, he's talking of India making the big leap into renewables. So these are good signs. Uh, but there is a gap between what you say internationally and what you do domestically. Uh, and I think this government uh, has done very well internationally, but domestically, uh, its uh, enforcement of laws leaves a lot to be desired because its clear priority is ease of doing business, uh, not, uh, you know, enforcement of environmental laws. And I think that is where, uh, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And you really have to walk the talk. And I don't think, um, I don't think, I, th I don't think this government is an exception, frankly. I think successive governments uh, have paid lip service to environment. Uh, they recognize environment and development have to go hand in hand. But when it comes to the crunch, development gets priority and environment gets the backseat. Thank you. That was that was great, um, my friend. You're also with us. Um, <coughs> good to be here. Yeah. You've been sitting there patiently. Uh, tell us about your book because you you have a pretty dire forecast for what lies ahead. Um, tell us. Yeah, I think the picture is generally speaking quite bleak. Um, I think that the hypocrisy that you're talking about or the disjuncture between rhetoric at the international level and domestic action is not just true of successive governments here in India, it's true across the world. We see it when Emmanuel Macron attacks Jair Bolsonaro for burning the Amazon and yet he has failed to pass a carbon tax. We see it when Justin Trudeau um, declares a climate emergency in Canada and then the very next day approves a new oil pipeline. Um, and given the pace and urgency of this crisis, I think while um, on some level, we have to applaud at least these rhetorical gestures towards action. The truth is that we need to be doing much, much more, much, much more quickly and much, much more universally if we have any hope of getting a hold on this crisis, which um, one way or the other threatens to envelop all of us and transform all of our lives. Um, and just to give you a sense of what, just exactly how urgent this is, um, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody who comes to this subject, I, I, I haven't been working on this for 13 years, I certainly haven't been working on it since 1972. I'm really a, a newbie, I'm somebody who was raised in the growth mindset of the modern West and thought that climate change was something to be concerned about, but one issue among many, 
and um, ultimately didn't think it was much of a threat to me, a lifelong New Yorker, um, because I thought that modern life was a fortress against the forces of nature. And the more that we advanced, the more that we could protect ourselves from whatever transformations climate change would bring. Um, I realize now, having spent a few years quite deep in this material, that I was really profoundly deluded about that. Um, and I came to think of myself as having really three constituent delusions, which I think it's useful to walk through in illustrating the full scope of the problem. The first is just about the speed of climate change. I had always been taught to understand that climate change was a very slow process, that it had started in the Industrial Revolution, and it had now fallen to us to clean up the mess left behind by our grandparents so that our grandchildren wouldn't have to deal with the, with the results. Um, it was a story of centuries, in other words. But half of all of the emissions that have ever been produced in the entire history of humanity from the burning of fossil fuels have come in just the last 30 years. And that's since Al Gore published his first book on warming, it's since the UN established its IPCC climate change body. Um, we've done more damage since then than we managed in all of the millennia that came before, which means we've done more damage knowingly than we ever managed in ignorance, which is quite terrifying. And we're now starting to see the impacts in real time. You mentioned the um, flooding, unprecedented flooding. Um, we've also had really incredible heat waves here in India, heat waves also all across Australia, the wildfires we've seen um, devastating that entire continent, now burning for something like three straight months at a time. Um, the city of Houston in the US has been hit by five, what are called 500 year storms in just the last five years. This is a storm we would have expected to hit once since Europeans first arrived in North America. And in fact, it's hit a single city five times in the last five years. So this is not um, a legacy of our ancestors. It is very much the work of a single generation, which is really to say ours. Um, that was the, my first big delusion was about speed. The second was about um, the severity of, of the crisis, uh, sorry, the scope of the crisis. I heard a lot about Arctic melt and sea level rise, and that made me think that if I lived anywhere but the coast, I was gonna be safe. And if I lived on the coast, I could move away from the coast and be okay. But the more I understood about the depth of um, climate research, which is now expanding into so many more fields and turning up many more impacts every day, the more I understood that there was no escaping this challenge, no matter where I lived, no matter what country I lived in, no matter how wealthy I was. Um, you know, the, uh, some economists believe that by the end of the century, if we don't change course, global GDP could be as much as 30% smaller than it would be without climate change. Um, there are impacts on conflict because there's a relationship between temperature and war. So we could have at least twice as much war by the end of the century. The same amount of um, land that we're using today to produce all of our grain could by the end of the century only be producing half as much. Um, and no matter where you look, every aspect of human life is affected to some degree or other. Climate change affects cognitive performance. It affects um, rates of schizophrenia and um, autism and ADHD. It affects premature birth and low birth weight. There's no aspect of life that it will be unaffected by this. It's not just about sea level rise. It is everywhere and all touching. And then the third big delusion that I had was about the severity of the crisis, which um, I heard a lot about this level of warming two degrees, which scientists called uh, catastrophic. And island nations of the world often refer to as genocide. And they, whenever they talked about it, they said we had to do everything we could to avoid this level of warming, um, which made me think at least that this was about a worst case scenario for all of us. But in fact, given where we stand now, I think it's about a best case scenario. Um, and just to explain a little bit why I think that way, today the planet is about 1.1 degrees warmer than it was before the Industrial Revolution, which doesn't sound like very much, but it means that the planet's already hotter than it has ever been at any point in human history. No human has ever walked the earth when it was hot as it is today, which means that everything that we've ever known as a species, you know, the development of the human animal, of agriculture, of rudimentary civilization, modern civilization, everything we know about ourselves as political creatures, as cultural creatures, as social creatures, emotional creatures, all of that is the result of climate conditions which we have already left behind. We now need to figure out what of the civilization we've brought with us to this point can survive the new climate conditions we've invented for ourselves, even as they get worse over time. So that's just at 1.1 degrees, when we're already outside the, in the window of human temperatures that enclose all of human history. Scientists say if we stop 
producing carbon today, totally zero it out today, we would probably be due for about half degree more of warming, just based on the carbon that's in the atmosphere already. And I think given all the political and economic and cultural obstacles that we face to that kind of rapid decarbonization, it's gonna be really hard to stay below two degrees. And two degrees, according to the UN, would mean damages from storms and sea level rise would grow a hundredfold. It would mean many cities in places like India and the rest of South Asia and the Middle East would become so hot during summer that at least during heat waves, you wouldn't be able to walk around outside without risking heat stroke and possibly heat death. The UN believes that, again, just at two degrees, we could be dealing with as many as 200 million, actually possibly as many as 1 billion climate refugees. This could happen as soon as 2050, just 30 years from now, maybe even sooner. And 153 million additional people, it's estimated, would die of air pollution, again, just at, at, one, at two degrees, which is um, a best case scenario. Things could get considerably worse still from there. How much worse is up to us, and I think it's very important to keep this in mind, no matter what level of warming we're at, ultimately we will be the authors of the, the climate of the following decade and the decade following and the decade following. Climate change isn't a binary system, it's not a matter of beating it or having it beat us. We're already living with it, we're gonna be living with more intense impacts in the decades ahead, but we are choosing today exactly how difficult that life will be for our future generations. And we're making those choices, certainly at the political level, where all of the most important choices are being made, but really at every level of the social ladder, as we're deciding what kinds of lives we wanna lead, what kinds of energy we wanna use, how we wanna organize our lives and our communities, how we wanna build, how we wanna travel. Um, in general, I think that the choices that individuals make in this enormous system are relatively small compared to the impacts that policy and legal action can have. Nevertheless, it is a story that we are all writing together as one humanity. We can together choose to write a different, more optimistic story, produce less carbon, and hopefully quite soon, no carbon, and produce a world for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren that at least looking at it from the vantage of today, we would consider relatively livable and relatively prosperous and relatively just and relatively equitable. But it's also possible that we move in the other direction and produce a world that would look to us today full of unconscionable, even unprecedented human suffering. And that is why it's incredibly important for all of us to be as activated, as engaged on this issue as we possibly can because if this entire problem was created in the space of a single generation, we now have about that much time only to t change course and avoid worst case scenarios. Which means, you know, I'm 37 years old, my life contains the entire story of the destruction of the planet to this point. My life is probably also gonna contain the next act of that story, which is to say, I've seen the planet go from seeming stability to the brink of catastrophe in my own lifetime, and I will also see what response we make and what kind of future we can secure for ourselves and our children while I'm still on this planet. This is an incredibly consequential time to be alive. Everyone in this, uh, in this audience will, is living at perhaps the most consequential time in human history, and each of you are yourselves consequential actors in that story, because each of us are participating in the system that is producing this problem, and each of us as consumers, but much more importantly as political actors, can make a change and try to um, redirect this system so that we are all in the future comfortable living on this earth, which is the only home any of us have or ever will know. That, that was an awesome uh, call to arms, really. Really nicely put on terrifying subject. Um, what about population control? Like, nobody talks about that in conjunction with the environment. And to me, that is a big piece of this, isn't it? Well, every person who walks the earth walks it with, human, with a carbon footprint. And so the more people on the planet, the more carbon will be produced, so long as we are living in a system that is based on carbon. Um, but if we are living in a different kind of a system, um, that calculus doesn't apply in exactly the same way. Um, and 
the truth is that on a per capita basis, uh, a new life that starts in the US is much, much more problematic than a new life that starts in um, India or Indonesia or Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and what concerns me about talk about population control is that it reminds me of you know, generations of eugenics and um, um, from the top uh, social, um, social uh, control that um, concerns me politically quite deeply. Um, it's also the case that the population of the planet is, the population hasn't peaked, but our, our, um, our rate of growth has peaked. Um, and likely the population of the planet will peak later this century and then probably decline somewhat. And all of the demographers and the earth scientists I know tell me that um, even at that peak level, which will probably be about 10 billion people, um, the planet can support that many people if we choose to manage that course of development properly. Um, the challenge for me is how do we, um, how do we make sure that we move development in that direction and not on the model that um, the West has been pushing for so long, so energy intensive, so wasteful and so destructive. Um, if we manage to you know, change course and adopt a much more sustainable path, I don't think the population um, is nearly as much of a concern as um, you're suggesting. On the other hand, if we don't change course and continue um, wasting the resources and polluting the planet in the way that we have over the last generation and indeed um, extend that model to parts of the world that haven't yet embraced it as fully as the West has, um, then population will be a, a quite dramatic control. But which path we take is still ultimately a decision that we can make. Um, we're not making in a single office by a single person, but we're collectively making as a species and can, I think, um, avoid making those kinds of difficult decisions if we, if we want to. Well, well, I think, you know, population is a convenient bogey. It's not population, it's consumption. That's the villain of the piece. Between 1992 and 2012, the population of China was stagnant, didn't grow. But its emissions went up four times. It became the world's largest emitter in that 20-year period. It's because consumption patterns changed. So it's not population increase per se. Population increase has other imperatives but not from necessarily only from an environmental point of view. From an, from an environmental perspective, it is consumption. What do people consume? How much do they consume? How do you produce what you consume? That's the real issue. And in 1972 at the UN conference, this was the whole debate. The entire Western world was telling the developing countries that population is the issue. And on the other hand, you had the Indian Prime Minister and others who were saying it's not population alone that's the issue, it's how you consume, how you urbanize, how you produce your energy, that is the real issue. And I think, you know, we shouldn't get into this trap of thinking of population as the un control of population as the answer to our environmental issues. I think we should focus much more on what we consume and how we produce what we consume, material intensive, energy intensive, uh, you know, and ultimately pollution intensive. Uh, we are, what we are doing is we are polluting our way to prosperity and we are deforesting our way to prosperity. And I think we need to f figure out a better way of doing it. And I can tell you, no country in the world is positioned as well as India is because frankly, the US has already reached a per capita income of $45,000. The Chinese have already reached a per capita income of $10,000. It's only India that's still knocking at the middle income, and therefore it's countries like India which have the luxury of making a choice. It's very difficult for the Americans to tell the Americans, don't have two cars, don't live in suburbs, don't consume so much, because you've already reached a level of consumption. But when you are at a low level of consumption, I think it's easier to make those choices, and that's why it's very important for India to recognize that grow now, pay later, is not an option that it should exercise. You have the spiritual values maybe in India as well that you, could, that you can apply. One tale from China is of a minister actually wondering whether the Communist Party might try and infuse more Buddhist knowledge and, and the Confucian knowledge because they recognize there's a real problem from the, the one child policy because, those, because parents could only have one child, those children have grown up selfish. And um, how do you then combat that selfishness? Because that child has been given everything that child wanted. So they're looking, in, in the Communist Party is looking at, at ways of bringing back those Buddhist values. So yeah, you, you have the 
those spiritual values here that can be applied. I yeah, think. actually they're going back, they're abandoning the one-child policy. Yeah. In fact, they've already liberalized the one-child policy to a very significant amount. So it's not, as I said, I mean, it's a population, uh, it's, it's an important issue. I mean, I don't think that we can advocate an ever-increasing population. That's not clearly, that's not what I'm advocating. All I'm saying is when we look at environmental issues, there are other other aspects which are important of the population and is how uh, how consumption oriented the population is the chinese are following the exactly the same model that the americans followed in the 50s and 60s big cars energy guzzlers you know energy intensive industries suburbanization uh, uh, that to not even vertical suburbanization horizontal suburbanization these all consume energy and these all add to the environmental stress but I would say even um, even quite doctrinaire growth-oriented economists um, are seeing a real change in what is possible because of the total transformation of, re of the renewable energy sector. 10 or 15 years ago, if you were saying to a country in the, in the middle income, a middle income country or de developing nation, you, that country really did face a dilemma. Do we grow more quickly or do we grow more responsibly? And now because of the um, real explosion of renewable energy and the collapse of price um, in uh, for um, solar in particular, less so for some other renewable sources. Um, it's now the case that even in, in middle income and developing nations, it can be possible to take a path that is both um, increases prosperity more rapidly and more responsibly. And that um, actually quite totally changes the, the moral calculus um, going forward where we no longer have to, um, the, the price of, of um, a sustainable planet is no longer asking the poorer nations of the world to stay poor. We just need to help them develop in a, in a more See, The one country way. that has made this transition, the one large country that has made, there have been small countries that have made this transition, but the one large country that is making this transition very successfully is Germany. Uh, you know, Germany, for six months a year, does not have the sun. Uh, so it, you cannot associate Germany as the number one solar energy user. The fact is today 30% of electricity consumed day in and day out in Germany comes from renewable sources. And this is, you know, it's a population of 80 million. It's not a small country. It's a rich country. They're making these choices. They're moving from private transport. They're moving to public transport. They're moving from fossil fuels to renewables. And I think if large countries like Germany are able to uh, and one of, the, one of the consequences of the German solar energy revolution is that India is benefiting because the prices of solar energy have dropped. You know, when I was environment minister, uh, the solar prices in India, solar energy prices, power prices, were 15 rupees a unit. Today, in this very state of Rajasthan, uh, there are units coming up at two and a half rupees, or three rupees a unit. There's been a dramatic decline in solar prices. And I think the one thing the one thing that we should all hope for and work for and dream for is uh, a, a mobile telephony type revolution for energy storage. You know, if you, it, it's inconceivable 15 years ago that we were all going to be carrying these little phones, smartphones with us. And I think energy storage is where f telephony was 15 years ago. And if there is a technological breakthrough, which I am sure there is, because there are a number of people working in this, you will find, because one of the problems with solar energy is only 20%. Uh, you get electricity only maximum 15 to 20% of the day. You don't get it throughout. So you still need fossil fuels, even if you're putting a solar power plant. But I'm sure that five years from now or 10 years from now, with this revolution in batteries, in storage, uh, renewables will become far more attractive. Uh, you know, not only for house use, but also for transportation. Let me just make one point, and then we'll uh, open up to questions. The, the poorest countries in the world suffer the most, and they produce the least pollution. It's, I was working in Africa before I came to India, and if you look at the amount of carbon that sub-Saharan Africa produces, it's tiny. <coughs> but when climate change affects these places, it, it dries out the, the soil of, of areas where people were barely surviving, and it pushes communities into conflict, the rising sea levels affect places like Bangladesh, and per capita, those people produce a tiny amount of carbon compared to what the people in Germany or the US or other places produce. So the inequality of this issue is, is really 
striking. I mean, it's, it's Germany, the reason why Germany's made such advances is because it's one of the most technologically sophisticated countries around. So it's, it's you know, and it's 80 million people, that's, you know, smaller than several Indian states. See, we've been, we've been uh, negotiating climate agreements for the last 20 years, but the crux of the issue, climate equity and climate justice, we have not been able to address. We have not been able to come to a satisfactory solution which, you know, incorporates the concerns of countries like Bangladesh and Africa and so on. You know, for Bangladesh, America is not the villain. It's India that's the villain because we are putting out so much CO2 in the atmosphere. So when Bangladesh says that the Sundarbans is under threat, it's because of India's policies or China's policies. But India con considers the Americans and the Europeans as a thing. So, you know, you really have, we, are, we have a long way to go before we can have a global carbon budget. Uh, and that budget is equitably allocated to countries. Uh, the first country to oppose this would be the United States. Uh, you know, they've already, they've already withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. Uh, and frankly, frankly, there can be no solution to the global climate crisis without the U.S. being serious about it. And the U.S. is not serious about it, except California uh, and perhaps New York City, uh, thanks to Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, the United States system is the most unsustainable economic system there is. Uh, it's simply not sustainable. And the power of the U.S. system is not that it is unsustainable for the U.S., but it sets the gold standard for the Chinas and Indias to emulate uh, later on. So I think we really need to put a lot of pressure. And I, I hope Mr. Goodman uh, becomes a proselytizer in the U.S. Uh, on client earth and tells the U.S. Uh, system that look by not looking at client earth seriously the way the book is recommending you're actually jeopardizing the Bangladeshis and the Maldives uh, and the Ghanas and the Kenyas not just the Indias and the and the China. I think one of the biggest issues around at the moment is in Australia which is one of those that is a more developed country that is really suffering and, um, and, it, and it's Peculiar for me how people can't own that. What, what's happening there, of course, is Indian related as well. It's the Adani coal mine. Um, I know it's not government related. It's private. It's a private corporation. But that would that would actually tip us over the edge. I think. You no, know, if that vast coal mine is brought about, one of the things that Cloud Earth is really doing now is taking on as its next mission is to to stop any new coal-fired power plant being built in Asia and actually to, to close down all coal-fired power plants in Asia. It has to be done. And uh, so you can actually bring out all the coal from the Adani coal mine and nobody will buy it. Wouldn't that be good? Incidentally, that coal mine is being put up by an Indian company. I know, yeah. <laughs> Let's let's say, uh, if it's the say. Indian company that's investing in the coal mine, it's an Indian company that's investing in the rail link, and it's an Indian company that's actually threatening the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you look but at Siemens all the environmental discourse in Australia, is on this one Indian company who's unfortunately, you know, who fortunately or unfortunately is a favorite company of the current government. <laughs> Let, let's, uh, let's hear from, from you guys. Uh, we got a few minutes left. Yeah, you can pick. You look qualified to pick. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, basically, like uh, Mr. Ramesh was talking about uh, the lack of awareness, uh, sorry, that we are not, we are doing very good on our awareness part. But my question would be that there are three areas. One is public transport. Another is following the Singapore model on the vertical gardening concept. S most of our building projects are not at all compliant with vertical gardening. Rainwater harvesting projects are still completely missing on various built projects. So what's to say on this? Even such small measures can contribute a lot. Why we don't have such policy enforcements? I think uh, public transport is certainly an area that we have horribly underinvested in. Uh, and we judge our economic health by the number of private cars we produce. Uh, if you're producing 2 million cars, the economy is doing well. If you're producing 1.9 million cars, the economy is in a tailspin. I mean, this metric of economic health that depends on the number of cars we produce, I think has been very detrimental to investment in public health. Our buildings are horribly in energy inefficient. Uh, we don't make use of the solar uh, endowment that we have. The best solar radiation in the world is in India, but we are nowhere when it comes to the use of solar energy in our architecture. And you're absolutely right, the way we d design our buildings. I think one thing uh, that we need to rediscover is the value of our forests. 
we have very large forest area in this country. We have almost 70 million hectares of forest, not all of good quality, but forests are the most effective carbon sink uh, that we have. And if we are able to improve the quality of our forests, we can't improve the quantity of our forests because, you know, there are demographic pressures, we are, we are a land-scarce country. But if we are able to improve the quality of our forests, then I think a large proportion of our emissions can get absorbed in these forests. And I'm one of the most exciting initiatives that is there on the world scene, I think uh, pr pr even President Trump uh, has spoken about it at Davos yesterday, is this one million tree uh, campaign. One million, trillion. one billion. Trillion. One trillion, sorry. One trillion, one trillion tree campaign. I think it's, it's very significant. It's very, very important. Uh, and uh, we as, we have very large forest area here, and I think one of the best things that we can do uh, to avoid the extreme risks of climate change is to ensure that deforestation does not proceed at the rate at which it is proceeded uh, in other countries. Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, day after tomorrow, at the Republic Day Parade, uh, the chief guest we have invited, the, as chief guest, the man who is single-handedly destroying the Amazon. So what signal that we are sending to the world, I don't know. There's a question here in the front row. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> this is directed to Martin Goodman. First of all, as a lawyer, I want to say your portrayal of lawyers is one of the most positive that I've heard in, in a long time. So thank you for that. Um, and I appreciate deeply what they're doing, bringing impact litigation on the environment. but. I wonder what you're doing for judges, because in your statement, you said that one Supreme Court said, what do we do as a Supreme Court? Yet in Poland, you've got judges who are actually shutting down coal plants. So much like Client Earth, is there a complementary consortium or education campaign for judges to tell them that they are the guardians of intergenerational justice when it comes to the environment? The only active one that Clyde Earth is doing is that training of the judges in the Supreme Court of, uh, in the people uh, of China. And uh, when it was the first organization from outside ever to be brought in, and they wanted to be trained up themselves first. So there it's working down and it's working down through the, the people's courts as well. In Poland, it's, you've, you've got the issue there of the whole rule of law is being challenged. It's happening even in Britain. That's what Britain was doing, you know, shaming the Supreme Court judges in, in front of newspapers as part of a peculiar Brexit debacle. And that's a particular challenge. In Poland, it is changing in that the, um, the, the, um, the government were calling client earth enemies of the people, and, uh, and they, uh, um, they were calling them terrorists. And now the Vice Minister for Energy is calling them in to help them write an energy transition plan because they know nobody else knows how to do it. So they are calling them in that way. But it, I think it's mostly at the EU level that the, uh, the, the pressure is being put on to maintain that rule of law. It's perilous and it's being challenged in all countries across the world. And it's hard to be a lawyer where rule of law isn't, isn't respected. I think here in, in India, it's interesting at the moment, the Supreme Court um, gave a powerful decision in January uh, about the air quality. They're, and they're, it was, you know, it was like India, a, shame, actually, it's a shaming thing. But is it, what effect is it having? Is it actually having any effect on the government? They're saying you should compensate these people whose lives are being lost. But what, what is the situation here between the power of the Supreme Court that's being very clear with its directives and the implementation from there? No, actually, India has had one of the most significant uh, innovations in environmental justice. Ten years ago, we set up the National Green Tribunal. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tribunal that any citizen of India, anybody in India can go and approach and claim damages uh, on pollution, uh, from the application, non-application of environmental laws, uh, from chemical contamination, from water pollution, and this National Green Tribunal, in the short period that it has been, has set very landmark decisions and forced the government, actually, to recognize the severity of environmental problems, and more importantly, give people damages. You know, that's, that's the new concept in jurisprudence. So, ten years ago, we took this step on the National Green Tribunal. There are only two countries, Australia and New Zealand, which have similar uh, systems. But I think this is one one concrete way in which you make citizens participate in the enforcement 
of environmental decisions. If you're aggrieved uh, by a power plant in your neighborhood, you go to the National Green Tribunal and say that, you know, your asthma has, has increased, your cardiovascular disease incidence has increased, and you will get a hearing, and more importantly, you will get damages from the National Green Tribunal. Guys, we're out of time, uh, but this has been a really wonderful panel, and you guys have said some very profound things. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for listening to us. much to our speakers for that wonderful session and to our sponsors the Motwa Jadeja Foundation, Motwani Jadeja Foundation. Uh, do note that the authors will be signing their books at the book signing desk located right at the entrance of Charbagh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being a fantastic audience. Now, we have one prize for someone who's sitting on the Zomato hot seat. So what you need to do is just check. All right, we have a winner there. Could you please bring the sticker along and claim your prize? We have a Zomato goodie bag for you. We're waiting for the lucky winner to come claim his prize. And he's making his way through the crowd. Here he is. Can we have a huge round of applause? For this lucky winner who was sitting on the Zomato hot seat, you could be the next one. Congratulations, enjoy the goodies. This Rajiv Circle Fellowship started about three years ago and the purpose of doing that fellowship is to bring in entrepreneurs from India and really plunge them and immerse them into the Silicon Valley so that you all get exposed to this interesting new way of thinking. The entrepreneurs that come through Rajiv Circle are stellar in their own right. So we really don't have to do anything. All we have to do is just maybe put them in touch with the right people and most of them take things forward on their own. Rajasthan seemed a bit like this. Wow, we'll all fit. All of us.
we have a very young author launching his book and we're all very excited about it. So I request the audience to kindly occupy the front rows first. We have a few vacant chairs here that can be occupied. Namaskar ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 13th edition of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival in association with Nexa at Charbagh. I've been most excited about this session all day long. Our next speaker, our next author, first I'm going to list out a few of his achievements and then let you guess his age. He's written two books, the first being Time Adventures, The Jackson Menace, and his most recent one, which is being launched, What a Mysterious World We Live In. He has won the award for Best Story Writing, Prince of the Year, first position in the Best Krishna Competition and Fashion Show, and in 2019, he won the Young Achiever Award. It takes most of us quite a few years to even write one book, and often we write one essay or an article and are super proud of ourselves. But our superstar here is only nine. Please welcome on stage Ane Saxena.
I'd request you guys to please keep your phones on silent mode. And also while you're waiting here, we have an exciting uh, music stage session in the evening at Clark's Amir at 6.30 with Gavin James performing. He's uh, toured with Ed Sheeran and Sam Smith, so make sure to catch that. Also welcome on stage uh, Deepa Agarwal, author, poet and translator who writes for both children and adults with over 50 publications to her name. Um, last year, when I went to uh, the Canoria College for Women to do their annual convocation or prize award giving, at the end, the principal asked if I would be happy to release a book. And I was like, oh God, I can't do yet another book. Uh, at which point of time, uh, young Ane came up with his book. And I don't know whether there's a copy of... Uh, So the adventures, or uh, the adventures that Jackson, uh, the Jackson menace, is what he showed me. And I said, there is no way uh, that a young kid of seven or eight could have written this. At which point of time, his mother brought me his diary, which was even more fascinating because when you saw the handwriting and the fact that every illustration in here was done by him, every illustration, it was like. Oh my God. And he and his parents have been coming to the festival for five years? Uh, since the age of what? Five? When you first started coming? Uh, no, they first, uh, last year was the first time we You came entered. to the festival. And he was inspired to write this book and I said we have to release his next book here at the Jaipur Literature Festival. So ladies and gentlemen, a name. Deepa, over to you. I'm going to just open that and then I'm going to run over. Come, let's take a quick photograph, all three of us. Come. Congratulations, Anne. You know, this is a wonderful moment for me. It's a real privilege and a pleasure to be part of this book launch. And, uh, you know, when I heard uh, that Anne wrote his first book at the age of seven, you know, it struck me that children are natural storytellers. Only we adults don't pay attention to their stories. Do you think that's true, Anna? I, I think yes. Yeah, see? <laughs> but your parents were not like that. Your parents did pay attention to your stories, didn't they? Yes, they did. And uh, you were telling me how your mother played a kind of a hide-and-seek game with you. Can you tell us about it concerning books? So... One day, it was just a normal day, it was at night and I was at the, I was seven years old and I was just roaming around my dining table looking for something and then suddenly, you know, there's, uh, there's a small shelf under our huge TV we have in our hallway. So, I looked into that and saw a book and its name 
and its author was Dav Pilkey. And when I opened it, it was so <coughs> amusing and addicting to me that I just kept on reading and reading till I finished the book. And I think its name was also very hilarious, Super Diaper Baby. <laughs> <laughs> so wasn't that a wonderful treasure to find? And I think before that, you said you were not that in, interested in reading till you uh, discovered this book? Well, I was n almost not interested in reading any single book, just let alone reading a 100-page book because when I even got a book, I used to pick it up and ask my mother to, mother or brother to read it out to me. Okay, so you see, I think there should be a big clap for Anna's mother <coughs> for using this strategy and maybe other parents can make use of it too. But uh, what I really find, found very interesting <coughs> was the sources of inspiration Anna has for writing his stories. <coughs> well, when I got the idea for <coughs> Time Adventures, The Jackson Menace, I, w I w really wanted to write it down. Like, it's about a scientist who has to prevent tragedies in the past. And then his former worker steals his time machine. <coughs> and then he embarks on adventures to stop him. You know, I got this idea when, when I was really into science, I wanted to become a scientist when I got older. And then I had been fascinated by the idea of a time machine. So then I just wrote a book. Amazing. amazing. <coughs> Inspiration <coughs> come, can come from so many, many places. And <coughs> I'll repeat what I said earlier that we don't pay at enough attention to children's imagination, the stories they create. But what I loved was how <coughs> Ane brings out stories through his interaction with his older brother. Can you tell us about it? Yes, so <coughs> my brother, Ant Saxena, was one of my heroes. Because, you know, when, when I was like five, we used to play this game, game about a child who is just literally just born in a plane. And I know, he was literally born in a plane. So he wants to escape the plane. He, so my brother used to pick me up and then high up in the air and then I used to try jumping out of it like the baby wanted to get out of the plane. I know. Well, <clears throat> we say some in Hindi, khel khel mein ye kaam ho gaya. You know, literally you did completed a task while playing. And I found this so fascinating that they, he brought a story out of a game that his brother used to play. And, and I also told me about the little plays he used to create using his toys and how the ideas for stories came to him. Now, when you look at this book, both of the books, <clears throat> they are beautifully illustrated graphic novels, you can say. And uh, they are amazing fascinating situations, there's science fiction, time travel in the form of science fiction, then other ideas about this uh, planet where the royal family sent the daughters out into outer space and the men give birth to babies. So you see, there are no limits to a child's imagination. But what I really found <laughs> very interesting and amusing was some of the names uh, Anna has created. So tell us about that. Well, 
At first, I was just going out making casual names, and then suddenly I, this thought appeared to my mind that why not just jumble the words? Think of that, you know. I have sometimes I have a hard time thinking of names for my characters because the names I use they have connotations. Maybe it's a person who I didn't like, and a name comes to me. I said, no, no, but I didn't like this person very much, or this is somebody I knew who had some kind of irritating quality or something like that. So I thought about it. I said, how does Anay change, choose his names, and how does he come up <clears throat> with some such fascinating names? Now, he has a monster in his book, which is called the... Chapati Lopolis. Chapati Lopolis. And how did he create this monster? Please tell us. So every day, I go to school, open my lunchbox, and what do you find there? Anyone guess it? Chapati. Chapatis, of course. <laughs> Every day. Every. It's almost been a streak for like four years now. <laughs> Too so, many chapatis, <laughs> <laughs> No, but in a good cause. Yeah, please go on. So my friends start joking about it. Some of my friends are surprised, like, whoa, how can you do that? That's impressive. But when, but like, I made up a name. I thought of it, and then I thought, make a monster, Chapati monster. He, he will be so large, he, he will be, uh, he will like, like a child will be there, like, and he will throw his Chapati into a puddle, and then the Chapati will be like, I'm born now. And I've become a <laughs> Chapati monster. <laughs> so his books are full of the most fantastic ideas. And I, <clears throat> I noticed in your earlier book, your characters go tri traveling, but they visit many different countries in the past. And they're going back to redress a problem in the past, to make uh, some, someone alive again. But they go to many places like far, as far off as Antarctica. So why did you do that? <coughs> well, you know, there's always that story that an alien gets stuck in the ice and people are trying to retrieve it from the dead. Like the ice age, like a mammoth, a, a mammoth is found frozen in an ice cube. So that's fascinating. Like, I'd like to mine out that thing all by myself. And also that no one even wants to go to Antarctica at some time. Like, if you're in the winters and you're thinking of something warm and suddenly Antarctica comes to your mind, you just try shaking it out, out of your brain like, no, go out. I, I, you're, you'll make me feel even more colder. Well, it's not a tourist de destination, definitely. <clears throat> but what do you like most about writing stories? Tell me. Well, most of it is uh, when I write, and that idea comes just zooming in, in like even faster than light. Like it just zooms into my brain, and then I get the idea, like Chapati Lopolis. I never thought of that at the first place, but I still wrote about it because everyone loves monsters, you see? Oh, good thing for monsters that people love them, and children especially in their stories. Well, that was a wonderful way to describe the Eureka moment that every writer is looking for. But you said something about creating your own world. How satisfying is that as a writer? Well, when I, when I like try making a story, it just goes like my, this is my world. I can do anything. I can make, make angels come out of the sky and then sh shoot curses on them, on everyone. <laughs> like, and then I can also make robots coming out, starting an apocalypse. And I can also make Birds, but their but their body is not a bird. 
It's a rat. So the amazing power of the imagination. And uh, definitely, I think that is one of the wonderful things about writing, that you can create your own world, you can control your characters. And I think it's extremely empowering. It makes you feel very strong, doesn't it? A person with a lot of power. It makes me feel like the god of the world. The god of the world, absolutely. And I think every writer feels like that when they are creating their stories. Okay, now uh, let me ask you, when you published your first book and you shared it with your classmates, what was their reaction? Well, the first book was released last year uh, at Canor Canoria, was it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, when, it sudden, uh, when the news suddenly broke out because after I came back from JLF and first stepped into school, my teacher was like, hey, look, Anne wrote a book. And then they started being surprised and looking at me and, that, and all that stuff and appreciating me. But still, I like to be a casual guy in front of them. Not like I'm, your, I'm, not like I'm superior than you or something like that. Wonderful, wonderful. You've got your heart in the right place and your head screwed on tight and that's what I love. Well, sudden fame can go to anybody's head, but you are smart enough not to let that happen to you, right? <laughs> okay, another thing I'd like to ask you about is the books you read, the books you are reading currently. How have your tastes changed? from the time that you read that first story, which you loved, the super diaper baby story, which hooked you onto reading? Well, first, I was only wanting to read comics because it's shorter to read, for me, at least. And also that I find it more fun with pictures uh, telling us how uh, how they work but um, uh, la sometime later i started reading the actual captain underpants stories He's, and you can and sometimes you can see there is a a small comic in front of it and they're uh, showing the fictional writers and then suddenly it just goes into one page as an illustration and the one page has only the text. And also now that I'm into some hilarious stuff and some maturity and all that stuff, like be mature, you child. <laughs> be mature, you child. <laughs> so children are told that so often. But another thing I found very fascinating that when you, you written a note at the back of your book, and you mentioned that you have improved a lot since your last book. And I think that's wonderful for a writer to admit that I am improving. How did you feel it? What made you think you've improved over the la since the last book? Well, if you actually got to read my rough copy of Time Adventures, you could see that I wrote some weird text like, like Hey, we defeated Hellscrawler! Yay! And then you'll, you'll be just creeped out by, uh, what, by what I just wrote here. And, well, it just, got, it just got improved. My brother helped me through that phase. Like, he told me that it can't just go like that and just get written like that. People will not like your book. So, he tried improving it, he told me how to do it, and then and I also improved it, and he gave me, he told me that a bit of new words could really make your book look, book look a bit fancy. And, I'd, and I'll also like to thank Kuldeep, Kuldeep Dhab, he's the illustrator, he's sitting right there, a bit next to my mother, the guy with the specs, front row, 
Oh, <clears throat> I wish you had come up at the time of the book launch. Kuldeep has done a beautiful job of the illustrations. These are graphic novels and the use of color. And I, I guess you had a lot of consultations because uh, Anay told me that he began with the, the original sketches and you interpreted the characters. Uh, can somebody give Kuldeep a mic, please? So that, you know, he can share the experience with us. There is an extra mic here. There's an ex extra, please come up on the stage. Please come up on the stage. There are two extra mics here. Uh, please, there are two extra mics. Please come up. Please, Kuldeep, please come up here. You are also the creator of this book. And uh, Anne had, you know, we were, I was in a previous section about writing for children and the discussion came up that how do you work with your illustrators. So now, Please, uh, Anna and Kuldeep are going to tell us how they work together because, as you know, graphic novel, the graphics are a very important part. Yeah. So, exactly. how do you do that? Am I audible? Yeah. So, first, Anna came to me and told about the whole experience of this book. It was so amazing. I feel so excited about it. Let's do it. And the time goes away and then <laughs> it comes to an end. And then finally I realized that it's a big thing. He started something and then uh, with the whole scenario, he built the whole story with the characters. Um, it was really fascinating reading every single line he wrote. And then it's a little hard work, daily routine, and then balanced up <laughs> with his character. And he's the gem of a writer, <laughs> I believe. He's going to be a good... Yeah. And also to uh, also to mention, mention that at, at when I first uh, when I first read his name, I was thinking that he would probably be an old th yeah, forty year like old <laughs> with uh, with beards and, and not wanting to hear about yeah. anything. Yeah, then I told him that <laughs> I'm not the old guy. I'm just a casual young <laughs> illustrator. I want to be a part of your book. Let's say where it's gonna go. This is, a, I think, a wonderful example of age not being a barrier at all. And they have worked so well in tandem to produce two beautiful, utterly fascinating books. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> Anne, uh, you know, when we write, when you write a book, an author, you need, you, you told us that you had story discussions with your brother, like the way we also discuss sto our stories with our editors and apart from that they are little you know issues of grammar and punctuation so who did anyone help you with that uh, yes my brother was the only one helping me for that because I was just seven and I also didn't know that every time I mention an I in the story it has to be capital I was just writing small in the cursive. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. That's just uh, so wonderful that you have an elder brother who is so supportive and helpful. And he helps you to create your stories, the aeroplane, the baby brawn in the aeroplane and the action. I just love that, <laughs> the, that beginning of a story that, uh, can you stand up a bit and demonstrate a little bit about it, how you do it? I'll hold um, the mic. Actually, no, that would, uh, that would break my... And that yes, would break something. Yes, you can. That would break something. No, no, you won't break anything. <laughs> no, he, he used to li lie down and lift, his, uh, lift both his limbs and lift all of these. And then I used to hang on. I, would, uh, I used to hold his hand and then and he was just doing this zoom, zoom, zoom. <laughs> oh, there's one minute left. Let's do this first. <laughs> is he there? Is he there, your brother? Is he uh, there? Yes, that, uh, that guy. That guy, raising his hand. Oh, please, Raise his hand. please Raise come his up hand. on the stage. Where is he? Raise his hand. Please come on the stage. Oh, that's just, and there's a the mic for you too. <laughs> so. There's another extra mic. Yeah, you want to 
tell us about the experience of working with your little brother? Well, I think that starting anything is pretty easy, right? But to end that and to end that so beautifully, that is difficult and I admire that. Because a lot of people, uh, they wake up and they think that today we're gonna accomplish this. Today we're gonna do this. But at the end of the day, they just uh, blame themselves for <laughs> not doing anything. But in this case, he was actually able to end writing the book and that is pretty amazing. Yeah, so that, that, see, that's a very major thing that you said. That he did it, you know, everyone has ideas, but very few people have the courage to follow through. Now, one more thing, I think we're almost out of time, but one thing I wanted oh. to ask you what, do you, what do you do when you run out of ideas? You told me something very fascinating. You know, at my age, I'm too old and fat to try that trick. But when he runs out of ideas, he says something, he does something. I, uh, I usually think that just fall down and uh, smack your brain a bit and, and give yourself an idea your, uh, you. So, so like. that's a wonderful way to end what people call writer's block. Just fall down and give your brain a smack. Thank you so much, Anne. This was such a wonderful experience for not only for all of us, I think, to go to the source of imagination, which is the cradle of all creative writing for all our stories. And hearty congratulations to you again, to your whole family who collaborated so beautifully, creating these lovely books, and to Kuldeep sir, as you call him, for you know, adding the colors and the images. And are the books on sale at the bookstore? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Please, please pick up copies of the books and, and I will sign them for you. Are you going to go for the book signing now? Yeah. Okay. So wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I'm sure you have had as enjoyable an experience as I've had in talking to Anne. And all the best for the book future books that you'll be writing and you'll be a great as great a writer I think as Dave P Pilkey whose books you like or Jeff Kinney also who you want to yeah. read <laughs> okay thank you very much oh Anes Saxena and Deepa Agarwal for that adventure of a session Do know that the author will be signing their book at the book signing desk located right at the entrance of Charbagh. The festival brochure and flyer with the full program are available for purchase at the JCB Prize for Literature Bookshop, managed by Full Circle. You can also grab a copy of your favorite book while you're there. Please help us in keeping the venue clean and dispose any waste items in the bins placed all over the Diggy Palace. The next session will be starting very soon.